Good evening. Welcome to MUFON Los Angeles. My name is Steve Murillo. I am the State Section Director for MUFON LA. We are honored and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. His name is Bud Hopkins. Bud Hopkins is a world-renowned artist, author, and pioneer of UFO abduction research. Having investigated well over 700 cases, he now heads the Intruders Foundation, a nonprofit scientific research and support organization. Bud first became interested in UFOs uh, when he and two others had a daylight UFO sighting in, uh, the, in 1964. And in 1975, he carried out his first major investigation, which involved a UFO landing and occupant incident in North Hudson Park, New Jersey. Shortly thereafter, he began uh, to concentrate on the investigation of the UFO abduction phenomenon, which led to the eventual publication of his findings. Taking together his three books, Missing Time, Intruders, and Witnessed, are widely regarded by research and skeptics alike as comp com comprising the most influential series of books yet published on the abduction phenomenon. But Hopkins continues to lead the investigation into the most controversial aspect of the UFO phenomenon, the systematic abduction of human beings by UFO occupants. As the world's premier expert on the issue, he has worked with more than 1,000 people who have reported abduction experiences over the past 20 years. These individuals came from all walks of life, including physicians, psychiatrists, attorneys, police officers, military personnel, political figures, personalities from the entertainment world, and even a NASA scientist. A prolific writer and internationally respected painter, Hopkins has delivered hundreds of UFO lectures around this country and around the world. His groundbreaking first book, Missing Time, was the first work to compare a number of UFO abduction cases in order to isolate the patterns that they revealed. His second book, Intruders, The Incredible Visitation at Copley Woods, was a New York Times bestseller and the basis for the popular 1992 uh, CBS miniseries, Intruders, which has since been broadcast internationally. His latest book is Art, Life, and UFOs, and there's some copies in the back. I highly encourage you to uh, see Bud afterward, get one signed, and take it with you as a memento of this evening. Despite its extremely controversial nature, Hopkins research has received serious commentary in such mainstream publications as Time, Paris Match, The Washington Post, The New York Times, uh, The New York Review of Books, Omni, People, and Cosmopolitan. He's been a guest on hundreds of television and radio uh, programs, including Nightline, Good Morning America, The Today Show, The Oprah Winfrey Show, The Tonight Show, Charlie Rose, Larry King Live, The Charles Grodin Show, and the list goes on and on. He's also been on Art Bell, Tom Snyder, Laura Lee, Hieronymus and Company, and Weekend Edition. Uh, I could go on forever, but I really, really want you guys to uh, lend an ear and uh, give a warm welcome to Bud Hopkins. Thank you. Thank, you very much. Thank, you. Uh, thank you for that very, very wonderful introduction and uh, <clears throat> for uh, the uh, way people have been so friendly and helpful uh, for this uh, couple of talks that I've been giving now in California. Um, I understand, Steve told me that we're in a, uh, um, a universalist church, so to speak, and uh, it reminded me of uh, Garrison Keillor's great uh, little question, what do you get when you cross uh, a universalist with um, a Jehovah's Witness? And what you get is somebody who still knocks on your door, but he's not sure why. <laughs> so uh, they're very gracious that we have uh, this place to, uh, to look at. You know, we, I'm noticing all these stars put up just for us, I guess. I don't know. <clears throat> but at any rate, uh, I've written this memoir. I guess comes a time in a lot of lives when you decide to... Uh, uh, put it all down uh, in a kind of uh, an emotional way in a certain sense, but putting together things which uh, you've been through that really don't seem to be in the public domain. But when I wrote the book, I tried to take out of it anything that would not be really interesting to somebody who has never met me, doesn't know me. Uh, my first version I really wrote for my daughter, and it was filled with all kinds of things about the family dog and so forth. There's none of that in this. 
And I, what I thought I'd do just to, just to start with, give you a sense of the, um, how this is written. Uh, I just, even though I'm a very terrible reader of my own work, but I, I'll just read the very first page uh, to give you an idea of what this is about. This is the way it starts. And it has to do with uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, where I was born. <clears throat> I said in 1931, the year I was born, automobiles were boxy, upright, and graceless. And my father, a Dodge and Plymouth dealer, struggled to sell them, not because of their stodgy appearance, but because of the ongoing Great Depression. A new Plymouth, costing up into the high three figures, uh, was an expensive item. We lived in Wheeling, West Virginia, where the lawns were broad, the elm trees shady, and society under the clueless Hoover administration happily asleep. Controversy was as distant as Peru. No African-American man, woman, or child other than a menial employee or servant ever crossed our threshold. The country club to which my parents belonged was restricted, a euphemism meaning no Jews allowed. And almost no one I was to know for the next 10 years of my life felt anything but hatred for President Mrs. Re Mrs. Roosevelt. In short, I was born into the end of the Luvian Middle West. Looking back, 1931 holds resonance for two major aspects of my life. In Paris, Pablo Picasso, one of my icons, turned 50, fell in love with the nomadic teenager Marie Therese Walters and began a series of voluptuous paintings of her, culminating in the next year, one of his greatest masterpieces, Girl Before a Mirror. In June, on June 10th, five days before I came wailing into the world, Sir Francis Chichester, the famous aviator, sailor, and author, looked out of the cockpit of his gypsy moth aircraft and sighted a dull gray-white UFO, which seemed to play a dangerous game of hide-and-seek with his tiny plane. At the time, neither he nor anyone else had any idea what this strange craft might be. But 33 years later, to my complete surprise, I saw one myself and began a second avocation. That's the way I'm going into this. And of course, the tying together of the UFO aspect of things and um, <clears throat> my career as an artist, ongoing as it is, uh, is something that I worked very hard to, so that it wasn't just a section about one totally without any uh, reference to the rest. And what I'd like to do is show you uh, a few slides which have to do with both art and the UFO phenomenon. Also what I want to do a little later is have plenty of time for, uh, for um, a Q&A. And um, if we could have the slide projector on um, well, I guess I do that, don't I? Is that right? Okay, now, this is not a Hopkins. This is a Willem de Kooning. But when I was at Oberlin and, and getting interested in art, uh, de Kooning, who painted this in uh, 1950, it's in the Metropolitan Museum, I was enthralled by these paintings because of their sheer energy. And if somebody asks you, does that look like a California painting or a New York City painting, you would all say, boy, that's a New York City painting if there ever was one, because of the energy and the charge and the jumpiness of it. And that's something I was very interested in. And when I came to New York in 1953, that was the, these were the artists I wanted to meet. And I met them very early on because nobody had any money. I go into the whole uh, beginning of this. Uh, but now I want to show you a couple of things I was doing. This is a painting in, uh, I did 1961, a small painting. And it's typical of what I was trying to do to create with a lot of energy, but to give the energy a sort of order. The de Kooning was essentially all over, like all, every part of it is charged the same way. And uh, I wanted to structure it in a way that there were some areas that were more charged and more active than others. And incidentally, don't worry, you're not going to have to look at a lot of slides of paintings. Uh, I once uh, gave a talk, my friend John Carpenter, uh, UFO abduction researcher, therapist, very nice guy, 
um, said to me, Bud, why don't you sometimes show some pictures of your, some slides of your work, so because people are curious. So when he gave a con had a conference in, I guess, Kansas or something, and he invited me to speak, I uh, brought uh, <clears throat> two slides of paintings. And uh, when he introduced me, I put on the first slide and I said, this is the first of 62 slides of my paintings because John thought we wanted to just deal with art now. And I could see gasping going on around the room. <laughs> and poor Carpenter, who has a kind of bald head, was sweating bullets over in the corner. And then I finally explained I was kidding. But this is the way I was working. Uh, <clears throat> At any rate, this is a, a big painting of mine. Uh, this is 1961, the same year. And again, it's, I, I was structuring things, but there were, it was, in a certain sense, a lot of different forces battling against each other. Now, this is uh, it's about a, a nine foot wide painting. It's in a very distinguished collection. And incidentally, I reproduced it on the back of the book uh, because it was a very fine example of what I was doing. Then, this is 61, 64 I have my sighting of the UFO, a daytime sighting. And I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of things that are in the book because I don't want to just be repetitious. Uh, and some of you have probably read about it, but I go into this in some detail in the book. But the interesting thing was, I said, well, this, this isn't having any effect on my painting at all, the fact that I had um, the sighting. And the uh, German uh, film uh, director and actor, uh, Maximilian Schell, looked at some of my paintings after the sighting. And in those paintings, I was, uh, I'm sorry, this is a little bit off, but that's, that's okay. I was structuring the whole thing now around a central circle. And um, I called these paintings sun black. I painted them shortly after the sighting. And when he said he felt there was some connection, I thought, oh, ridiculous, it's not, no connection. But for the next 20 years, practically every painting I did had a big circle in the middle of it. And he told me I should go see uh, uh, the movie 2001. And he said, it's, there's something about that that reminds me of the things you were telling me about that sighting. And I went to see the movie, I thought, this is ridiculous. This doesn't have anything to do with, with my paintings. But apparently, uh, apparently it does. Now, what, just a very simple thing. If you, if you look on the black circle on the, on the left side, because the thing's sticking into it from the outside, uh, it can look like um, it's lying on top of the blue. But when you go to the other side, it's like a disc on top of the blue. Um, on the other side, uh, there's a deep space behind it, so you're not sure where, where this disc is, the circle. And I wanted that kind of ambiguity all the time. This is uh, another uh, painting I did at the same time with this, the purple disc. This was my attempt to, to vary the circle all the time, but the circle was always there. This is 1969. At any rate, um, there was definitely some kind of connection, but I was always looking for more structure and more order. Now, this is a big painting. It's about 11 feet long. It's in three uh, panels, which I call Mahler's Castle. It's in the collection of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And it, it's a painting I actually dreamed. It's hard to believe. I woke up in the middle of the night and I had seen this thing in my dream. I found a pencil on the bed table and I made this little sketch and the next day I made a collage and then I ultimately worked up to 11 feet. But these got very temple-like. Uh, it's almost as if there are four vertical supports and then an architrave and the circle is dead center in the middle, which it never was in any other paintings. Uh, but it has a sort of iconic quality. And I was somehow, this is 1972, again, I was not an active uh, UFO researcher or anything like that, but um, this, this painting changed a lot of things in my work. Um, now, <clears throat> in 1975 is when I had my first investigation, and that's with the George Obarski case. That's George on the left and me on the right, in case you had trouble telling us <laughs> who was whom. 
this was um, a photograph taken by the Village Voice back in uh, 1975, I believe, Ian. Uh, this object landed, um, and I go into this in, in some detail in the book, the UFO landed uh, right across the Hudson River from Manhattan, and uh, George was in his car, three in the morning going home from work, and uh, he was absolutely terrified. And uh, these small figures came out, and uh, he was 60 feet away, and they uh, had little little shovel-like things, spoon shovel things, and little bags, and they just quickly dug soil samples. It's a very long, complicated investigation I did, and that's the first thing I actually really looked into, and I put it, uh, I wrote an article about it in the Village Voice, uh, and it's still an extremely important uh, case for me, and I also, in the, in the book, when I talk about it, I have a, something in there about a personal element that was surprising, but again, I don't want to give all this stuff away. Otherwise, no one's going to want to read the book. <laughs> this is George in front of um, uh, the building where the second witness uh, saw the whole thing unfold. And that round building, which is right on the Palisades, overlooks the Hudson River. Believe it or not, the UFO lands in front of that building behind George and the name of the building is Stonehenge Apartments. <laughs> now, I don't know that that means anything, but the other thing that was really dramatic about it was the only apartment building in New Jersey that I'd ever been in in my life because a collector of mine commissioned me to do a painting for one of those rounded rooms up there. So I had been to the site of this thing, uh, where this thing landed uh, some years before uh, this case turned up. This is kind of upsetting. <laughs> the doorman, um, I'm not sure how the focus is working here. The doorman, uh, this is not the doorman who saw it, but he was, another doorman was standing right there, uh, the, the right side, when he saw the lights of this thing come down in the park. And as he was looking at it, he picked up the phone uh, some distance away, but he could see it very well, to call a, a friend of his who lived in the building at an apartment to wake him up to look out the window. And at that point, there was a high, um, high-pitched vibration, and the window shattered, the one on the right. So I did all kinds of investigatory work. But this sort of launched me into saying, my God, this is real, much more so even than in my own sighting. Now, in 83... I heard from Debbie, uh, who's on the left, and her sister, Kathy, on the right. Debbie was the one I wrote about in Intruders. But I should go back a minute and say something about the, my, my first the book before this, which was Missing Time. And uh, a gentleman is here tonight who's one of the people I wrote about in that book, Michael Bershad, and uh, maybe when we have the book signing, you can, he can come back and you can shake his hand. He was, it was a very important case for him. But at any rate, um, when I wrote the book, one of the reasons I did was because I had begun to find lots of abduction cases. Because of my article in the Village Voice uh, about the uh, landing, the Obarski case, Stonehenge, uh, I was getting all these letters and phone calls because I'd done radio shows and so forth, and by God, I was unearthing abduction cases left and right, and I didn't know much about abductions. And one of the people who uh, came to light was Debbie, but because she had read Missing Time, that first book. But one of the reasons I wrote the book was, was up until that time, the assumption was these are really, really rare. Abductions just really, they... The poor uh, Betty Barney Hill, they were just driving in the wrong place at the wrong time, so they were a target. And it's important to remember that the Hill case happened in 61, actually. And the next case that, we, that got any attention at all of abductions was 12 years later in 73, and that was the Pascagoula case. So people thought, oh, gee, Th those people who accepted the idea of abductions, even within the UFO community, many people didn't, investigators. 
but we thought, oh, just a rare thing. But it is just astonishing. Uh, I noticed the sea of hands when the question was asked, when Steve asked about who has seen what. And just as a little a kind of immediate personal thing, um, <clears throat> day before yesterday, uh, no, excuse me, yesterday, Monday, I had to go to the, uh, see my lawyer about something. Says, These are new people. I don't know them very well. And when I walked in uh, and we were sitting down, one of the young lawyers said, uh, I should tell you, Bud, about my UFO sighting. They didn't know anything about what I was doing, except that, uh, you know, pro probably that heard about it some way, but there wasn't any communication. He said, I had, I had a sighting. He, he said it was at 83, and it was in the Hudson Valley. And probably those of you who know, remember these things, the Hudson Valley area in New York was filled with these giant triangular floating things, huge thing. Well, he said he and uh, six kids, young people, uh, were going out at night and they were crossing this field. I'm not sure, I don't remember where they were heading. I just heard about it yesterday. And um, <clears throat> he said, all of a sudden this thing came over the trees and he said it was gigantic, gigantic. And he said, we just stood there looking at it, just in total amazement, lights around it, big bright lights on the corners, and it just coasted it very slowly, no sound, across, and then it's gone. And I'm saying, well, I'd like to talk to your friends too, the whole thing to be looked into. But here's a case, a very, very good close encounter, low level thing that just turned up yesterday uh, from my law, in my law office that I was visiting. But I was beginning to think that this whole thing was so widespread. And it, it was one of the main reasons why this was hard to accept. You could accept, well, one here and one there. One, but all these people and all of these abduction cases they, as they were mounting. So I felt that that story had to be told. I also, of course, discovered that there were physical marks on people. Uh, this is what I wrote about in uh, Missing Time. And uh, also that this happened again and again to the same people. There was a kind of an unwritten rule amongst early investigators that if somebody had two sightings, two sightings, that meant they were making it up because sightings were so rare. Well, we're talking about abduction. What if somebody's coming in and we, we discover two, three, four, ten or more abductions? Do you dump them? No, because you find that happens over and over again. At any rate, um, this was a very important case for those of you who uh, read Intruders and also, of course, seen the miniseries, which was changed drastically. Uh, this was the first case where uh, the, I began to see the marks falling into this particular pattern, the scoop marks. Uh, Debbie has two in front of her uh, shin. And um, I've now seen, I would imagine, 70s, 80 of these things on people. We don't know why they're taking the samples, but I'm just kind of reviewing. This is a close-up, what it looks like. Reviewing some of the things that, that I discovered along the way. That's, that's one of the ones on her leg. Uh, this is a little boy. Uh, often, they're round when they're first made, and as the person gets older, the skin stretches because the body is growing. Uh, that's on a little boy about uh, five or six years old. Here are two other cases up close. This is an Australian case with a, a sort of a dimpled thing with a scar coming out of it. Uh, a nurse um, who had this, when she had apparently an abduction case, uh, an abduction experience when she was a little child, an infant in the hospital. And she was taken out of the hospital apparently and when she was returned, here was this on her leg and uh, nobody had any idea how that happened, what caused it. Okay, um, now, after, the, well, this was in, actually in 83, uh, this was the work I was doing. At the time, the, the uh, intruder's case was unfolding. And this, the, the orange uh, piece on the left, I call a guardian. It's like a sentinel-like thing, and the white piece, I call a temple. 
and it cuts out a perfect square. And as you can see, there's yellow, of course, on the inside, and there's an opening at the top. So the light comes down, and the wall begins to light up like a, like this sort of magical golden space. And the object inside is a, like a little altar. So I was making these works, which are fully modern works, but they were referring back to altars, temples, and guardian figures. Guardians, whether they're angels, whether they're uh, uh, devils, animals, serpents, whatever. Every culture seems to have one. I'll show you some of the uh, little chopped at the top. This is a guardian uh, painting. Uh, now, all of these are close to life size. In other words, human scale. They're on wood, and uh, I wanted them to have the kind of energy that I had in the early work, except here, uh, seen through the color and these kind of dynamic forms. I'll show you some of these quickly. Here's another one. Here's another one. I, I painted perhaps um, 60 of these. I don't have many. Now, just to connect again with, with things that were happening in my researches, and I have a lot of things I want to t tell you a little bit in just a bit, but uh, some of these cases that I got involved in, uh, this being the Gulf Breeze case in Florida, and I went down early on, it's, it's complicated how I got to know the people, and uh, this was one of the Polaroids Ed Walters took, and this was a, a Polaroid, the white forms on the edges are because he had the flash on, uh, illuminated uh, foliage in the backyard, and then this thing was out beyond there. Uh, it's kind of odd looking, and people are always saying there aren't any good UFO photographs. Uh, that's the big skeptical thing. Um, this is pretty good, but um, when <clears throat> Bruce McAbee, the optical physicist, got to work on some of these photographs that he took, since they're Polaroids and you have no negative to, to fool with, uh, what uh, he did was he, he put a huge amount of light shining against the, uh, the image and then re-photographed that. And of course, with a huge amount of light, he could get more details uh, from, the, uh, from the dark Polaroid. And taking this image that we're seeing here, this is what it looked like with light on it. Uh, and of course, it, there's discoloration because of, of the light on the uh, on the foli on the um, <clears throat> the different layers of chemicals and so forth. Um, this this case was attacked, but um, by a lot of people. And it, one of the interesting things is, everyone can accept a UFO photograph of some blobby thing that's seen far away, but if it's like this. They say it has to be a fake. It's like they don't want to accept the idea that, in fact, there may be something like this. Uh, well, at any rate, um, this was um, in that that particular that particular case, which was a fascinating one. All of these are long stories. Anybody has some, uh, you know, some mental question you want to stash away in your head to ask a little bit? Uh, not so much now. All right, let me, um, let me take a little digression here because this whole thing is dealing with my entire life and all sorts of stuff. Um, all kinds of adventures I've been through. Um, let, me, let me read um, one more little passage, end of reading from the book, uh, which you might find interesting. Um, well, if we... If we uh, can't find, if we can't get it to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll back with it. You know, we'll just gonna backwards it. doesn't work, does it? Okay. Uh, now, one of the things I've done in, in the, my memoir is I have short pieces, uh, a few, th three about painters that uh, I knew or was very friendly with or was involved with in one way or another. Uh, and that's uh, Mark Rothko, Jackson Pollock, and Franz Klein. And in the UFO field, I have three similar 
pieces, one about, um, <coughs> excuse me, about Alan Hynek, and another about John Mack, and another about Lawrence Rockefeller. And I think there are those of you who know uh, Lawrence Rockefeller's involvement with the UFO subject. And um, uh, Lawrence was the, the brother, he died, I believe, a year and a half ago, something like that. He was the brother who was in charge of giving money away to people. And uh, he was a very, very nice man. And he was a good friend of John Max. And so John arranged a, uh, a meeting where David Jacobs and John and I would all go to Rockefeller's mansion out in uh, Botanico Hills in, on the Hudson. And uh, we would talk about, this was in 92 when um, uh, Bill Clinton had just been elected. What Lawrence wanted to do to try to get quote unquote disclosure, a word which has become totally meaningless over the past 30 years that it's been used as something that's about to happen and doesn't happen. So anyway, we had this interesting experience with Lawrence. And uh, I'll, I'll just read a little short piece, but first there's a little story. I, I try to have a little bit of humor in this whole business. But I said one of the better known Willem de Kooning stories describes the time he met Lawrence Rockefeller's brother, Nelson. Nelson Rockefeller was the governor, of course, of New York. In the late 1940s, when this major collector of modern art bought a de Kooning abstraction, it was a prestigious sale that marked an enormous breakthrough for the financially struggling painter. He had often talked about how, as a child in Holland living in poverty, his family sometimes referred to the Rockefellers as symbolically representing an unattainable uh, peak of wealth and power. He said as a little kid, he would say he wanted, he needed something, a new coat, and his parents said, who do you think you, we are, the Rockefellers? Um, and now he told his friends, he had even been invited to a party at the Rockefeller's splendid New York apartment after the, the purchase. Um, he uh, went there and uh, he said, it was one of those classic, if my parents could see me now, events. Uh, Bill was wearing a suit for the occasion, he said, and he remembered to take off his inelegant Dutch seaman's cap and slip it into his overcoat pocket before he entered the apartment. When he was ushered into the reception hall, Mrs. Rockefeller, happy as she was known, came over to him smiling gaily and resplendent in a beautiful gown and glittering jewels. Apparently, he gazed at her with awe and then paid her a compliment he had learned years ago from his artist friends. Mrs. Rockefeller, he said with feeling, you look like a million bucks. <laughs> Which is probably not the right thing to say. Um, but at any rate, um, the, um, what happened is, is uh, Rockefeller wanted to discuss uh, what we could do to get um, the whole gov the UFO issue made public. And he was a very gentle man, uh, very much an optimist. And um, at this point, um, I was able to brief him about um, the Linda Cortilla case that I wrote about in Witness. I hadn't written, of course. Uh, this is 92. And when I asked uh, Lawrence if I could display two short pieces of videotape dealing with the case that I still never made public, uh, <clears throat> uh, he agreed and led John, David, and me up to his bedroom. The downstairs VCR was apparently broken. I felt an unexpected, somewhat uncomfortable sense of intimacy in the room as the four of us sat around and on Lawrence Rockefeller's bed to watch the tape. I suppose the grandeur of the Rockefeller name when combined with the courtly manners of this venerable and distinguished gentleman whom I just met made it difficult for me to accept that I was merely in someone's bedroom with colleagues watching a videotape about a UFO case. This odd scene was just another of the many unexpected little collage moments I've lived through. But later in a den like meeting downstairs, the four of us discussed the issue that was currently occupying a central place in Lawrence's thinking. 
how to persuade the government to release whatever important information it might be concealing about the UFO phenomenon. He explained that he had met Bill Clinton on several occasions and thought that if he wrote the new president a polite letter and simply asked him to release whatever information the government was withholding, Clinton would agree and the information would automatically be made public. I saw this hope as unbelievably naive, though I didn't say so out loud. Uh, an official announcement that some unknown possibly extraterrestrial craft displaying a technology vastly, uh, uh, vastly superior to ours uh, were operating well on our planet might well unleash an intolerable degree of social and economic chaos. And no government, I believe, would dare risk it. Neither Clinton nor any other government leaders I could think of would publicly admit to our utter impotence in the face of such a potential threat. However, Lawrence, ever the committed optimist, said he was sure that a Clinton, that A, Clinton would comply with his request to make the UFO issue public, and B, that this official statement would not cause any real social or economic upheaval. He was determined to write his letter to the new president. I told him what I thought would happen. Clinton would send <clears throat> Lawrence's request on to NASA, the Air Force science advisor, and would then be told there's no secret stash of UFO evidence, that all UFO reports are easily explain explainable away, there was nothing to worry about. The decades-long official government policy. Lawrence disagreed. Bill Clinton was a fine man and would comply with such a request. Meanwhile, I had thought of a more covert way to find out what the government agency or agency handling UFO matters might really know and decided to lay it on to the other three. At this time, 92, I knew that Lawrence was acquainted with many prominent government officials, mostly Republicans, who were then either out of office, retired, or working in the private sector. People like Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Barry Goldwater, and Donald Rumsfeld, of all people. Uh, figures from the world of internal, of international diplomacy like uh, Perez de Cuellar and even a few people still holding public office like Senator Claiborne Pell, who I knew from personal conversations was deeply interested in the UFO issue. My plan was simple. I suggested that Lawrence invite five or six such people for a private weekend at his home so David, John, and I could brief them in depth about the evidence, the complexity, and the portentiveness of the, of the phenomenon. It was possible, I thought, that some of these prominent figures might have retained contacts within the government, perhaps people in lower positions, who might be willing to leak some information to us or provide a few names of those who might. It seemed almost certain that some of these individuals who knew a great deal about hidden UFO evidence might regard it as their duty to the public to release anonymously, of course, some of that information. It was worth a shot, I said, and I guess that few of the political figures I'd mentioned would refuse Lawrence's invitation to such a confidential and absolutely private meeting. No, said Lawrence to this proposal, I'm just going to write my letter to Bill Clinton and ask him directly. And very shortly he did, to no effect. That's the famous Rockefeller initiative, at least part of it. I still think my plan might have worked. Anyway, <clears throat> Now, this is in the book, and I'd like to tell you about a, a case that is uh, not in the book, uh, and it's on a different subject. One of the pieces of background here is that I wanted to write, include in the book, uh, things about the abduction phenomenon, the UFO phenomenon, that would be persuasive to people who would read it, because I had the feeling, well, there are going to be some people in the art world who are going to read it and, and so forth. So I was very interested in the early time of my development, how I began to find this evidence. And I have one long case that I've never really written about before in the book. Um, I wanted them to take them sort of by the hand through the same steps that I've gone through. So I left out certain things. I didn't talk about hybrids. For instance, uh, that was a hybrid slide that we stopped that incidentally. Yeah, I was going to show. Gonna see it because if the paper that this is framed in is yeah. Old and it's, 
Oh. Actually expanded, so okay. Have well, that's that's okay. Uh, some of these are from the 19th century, I think. You know, I've been at this a long time. But one of the uh, <clears throat> things that I didn't talk about, in addition to the hybrid situation, uh, because I thought that's going to be too much for people to take, although I, I went into much more detail about the, the things that really led me into this. But I didn't mention anything about the crash retrieval uh, phenomenon. And this is a case that I uh, have not really written about, but I think you might find interesting. Years ago when I was in, uh, actually I believe it was uh, 92, I was in Albuquerque at a MUFON conference and I met this couple uh, who were, I would say, in the 60s. Uh, the husband was a retired um, a state police officer, a high-ranking officer, and his wife was actually uh, an abductee, and that's how I met them. And uh, oh, there's, okay, there's my. Uh, we're looking at sculptures. Thank goodness for fixing this. This is what I call my ritual bridge. It was a sculpture I did in an outdoor park, in um, in Brooklyn. It was about 70 feet long and. It's a, it's a long story, which I'm not going to go into, how it worked out. The opening at the, um, at the, in, at the distance is the, um, the shape of the horns of the bull, which is a, a, a classic religious symbol from uh, the Minoan culture. Now, this was the very weird and touching thing. I arranged the sculpture so you could sight right through to the World Trade Center in the background. And I've written in the book about my uh, being down at the edge of the river and seeing the second building implode. And the whole thing was pretty wrenching. Um, I'll show you a few more. These are my sculptures, which I call altars. Sometimes they put out very spooky shadows. Another altar. This one is in the collection of the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Oh, now we're into the, okay, I'll just run through this rather quickly. Uh, that's a little model that uh, uh, a woman made of the little hybrid baby she was shown uh, with these huge eyes and no hair and so forth. Uh, some of these pictures uh, I'm sure are familiar to some of you. I have several people who have said they held this little fetal object in their hands. Actually, three different people have described that experience and how creepy it was. This one has his eyes closed. Oops, well, we'll skip that one. That was uh, Kathy Davis's drawing. Some of these drawings are crude because the people are not that skilled. Uh, but what's interesting is even when they're crude, uh, what you get here are these giant eyes, which are almost always blue. Uh, the hair is blonde and it, straight, it doesn't cover the head, and the face is rather distorted. This is a, a case just to show how widespread it is. This is uh, uh, from uh, Turkey. A very interesting case. She put question marks where the arms were because she wasn't sure where they were. But it was that distortion of the head. This is another one. This is involving the Linda case. And Linda's feeling was she was wearing a wig. Apparently not in style either. And here's another one from yet another case. I have many of these. This is the hybrid situation. And uh, some of these stories are a little too complex to, to go into. I'd rather talk about this crash retrieval thing because I'm sure some of you are very familiar with this material. And the last the slides I'm going to show you, because I didn't reproduce them in a Sight Unseen, but these are the four pictures that um, came from Australia. The man took um, of his family, they took them of each other, and uh, when they were developed, they were all red, as you see. But 
he, the shocking thing was he said, we weren't in the pictures and we were just standing there when we were photographed. And this is apparently, here's another one, they were just standing on that little bunch of sand. This is, this is one of the most incredible cases, but it, it's the only time we've, I've gotten anything which suggests proof, to, or not proof, evidence to me that, that people are unseeable. And there's a lot of evidence in, connected with this case, which I wrote about in um, Sight Unseen, and I don't want to, to uh, go over that again. Uh, so that's the end of our slides here. But let me tell you about the Beanie case. Um, should we turn this off, or what should we do? It's going to be too dark. Um, any rate, <clears throat> so back to these, this couple that I met, uh, the uh, state police officer retired and his wife. Uh, and I worked with the wife, and it was a straight abduction case, very interesting. And um, about uh, oh, three or four months later, they called me uh, that I should talk to this woman. They had been to a, a MUFON meeting that had been advertised in the local, some kind of local uh, giveaway paper. And they met this woman, uh, older woman, who calls herself Beanie because her last name was Bean. She passed away uh, about two years ago, unfortunately. But uh, they said that uh, she had gravitated to them after the meeting when people were talking and having coffee and so forth. I think we're, everyone's here is, is getting a high, a really top of the line glass of liqueur, I think, isn't that? Maybe I got that wrong. That, uh, <laughs> At any rate, uh, we could dream. But the thing is that um, she, when she came over to them, she said that uh, something had been bothering her. She remembered this thing that happened. Uh, and it, uh, it was very upsetting to her. But she tried to put it out of her mind years ago. It happened in the 60s. And uh, at the time, she was a m medical technician at a little, tiny little hospital, like a five-bed hospital in a small town um, about 200 miles or so from Albuquerque. And she said that uh, the whole thing came rushing back because she'd seen on television uh, footage of these starving children in Somalia. And they seemed to have very large heads and very skinny bodies, of course, from, from starvation. And she said it reminded her of these little figures that she'd seen. So what happened is she told the story and I called her and I recorded it and so forth. She said that um, her job included, she was the x-ray technician, she also uh, rode in the ambulance. And the ambulance was a converted Ford station wagon, really broken down thing. I mean, it, it was new at the time, but didn't have anything. She said nowadays, uh, uh, an EMT ambulance is a rolling emergency room. She said, in those days, she said, we had a little oxygen and a lot of speed, and that was it. And uh, she said that they got a call uh, to go to, for an accident in such and such a location, came from the state police. And uh, when they got there, where the, this was in the middle of nowhere, there's a, um, a sort of a big um, flat plain uh, and in the distance was, were two police cars and a little kind of rise. And uh, so they drove out and across. And uh, when they got there, there were two policemen, one from each car. And uh, she got out and she said, um, the, she said, what have we got here? And the policeman said, well, this is the, the, what we've got. And she said, there were three little bodies lying there. And uh, th they were partially burnt. And at some point she saw then this small object. She said it didn't seem much bigger than a Volkswagen or something, sort of partly stuck out of the hill. And she said to the policeman, where are their parents? And he said, well, this is all we've got. I don't think there are any parents. He said, I think this is, I think we've got to call the Air Force. So. 
She said, she and the ambulance driver, uh, they had the, the gurney out of the car. They put two bodies on the gurney and rolled them back into the ambulance. And she said, we had a stretcher, so we brought the third one back. Now, first of all, we should remember, lots of people have talked about seeing bodies like looking through a doorway or something. She's got these things in her ambulance. She's handling them. She got, they drove back and um, the policemen were calling the uh, Air Force, which there was a, some kind of installation not too far away. She took the bodies in the uh, emergency room entrance. I've been to this little hospital. It's made of cement blocks. It's pretty crummy. And um, she took x-rays. She said that, first of all, they were wearing some kind of, of garment that she said she didn't know what was the result of the heat or the partial burning, but it was very hard, very, very hard. And uh, she said, because there was damage to all three bodies, she said, if you put pieces of the three together, you could sort of figure out what they look like. But she thought they were about so big, and they had big eyes. She described a different kind of hand that they had, uh, I believe, four fingers that were short and a little tiny thumb, which, which is very unusual. She said that when she took an x-ray, she said she could get everything from the neck down to the pelvis on one of those x-ray sheets. I mean, these are little people. And when I asked her what she could remember about the x-rays, she said that they didn't seem to have a sternum. She said, but there were three or so, four maybe, big like ribs that went all the way around, unlike us where they meet in the middle. At any rate, uh, she took the x-rays and she had her notes, a little scribbled notes she'd made about the call, which she had to do every time the ambulance went out. And she pinned up these things, called the doctor who, there was one doctor attached to the hospital. He came in and checked for vital signs, which she had done, and she, he, he wrote a death certificate for them. And at that point, I guess who arrives but the Air Force. And she said there were several vehicles, and she said a, a colonel came in with a couple of other men with three little boxes. And they took the bodies and uh, put them in the boxes and took them out, and the colonel said, I want everything you've got, took the x-rays down, and she complained. She said, you know, but the, the x-rays were, we had to wash them and they weren't dry yet. And she said, and they took them wet like they were, and they even took my, my uh, clips with me, that, with them that were supposed to clip them up. Put them in the ambulance, I put them in, the, uh, uh, in their car or whatever, and the colonel said, this never happened, and you were never to talk about this. And he said, remember this, the uh, government has a long arm. Scared her to death. One other person, apparently, uh, who was a, a nurse, a nun, uh, saw the bodies. And the, the colonel, the driver, uh, the uh, uh, doctor and the driver of the ambulance. So, as she's telling me all this, now, this woman seemed as, as honest as you can imagine. And I'm thinking, this isn't just a crash retrieval where people cite stuff. I mean, the woman took their x-rays of these bodies herself, remembered what they looked like, was scared to death. And she said, you know, by the, we had a, a little canteen where they coffee machine and so forth. And she said, the people who worked in the hospital, she said, you know, not much happened out there. And she said, if there was a, a crash on the highway, which there often was, and someone was badly hurt or killed, she said, why don't we talk about that for three or four weeks? She said, we, no one ever mentioned this, ever. So <clears throat> she got the retired officer in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, st state police, she, 
she asked him if he knew the name of the driver, the, the one in charge, the policeman that day, because she remembered his name. And he said he, he vaguely knew him. So they were, they, she said, oh, we gotta find him. Now this was, of course, a terrific sign of credibility because if you're making something up or you're not sure you're exaggerating, the last thing you wanna do is locate a witness to it who's gonna say, what are you talking about? But she was determined. They located the guy uh, and they found out that he had had a heart attack, it was in the hospital. And she said, we gotta go to the hospital and see him. He died. And she wanted to go to the funeral. So she went to the funeral and she interviewed his brother, who was a sheriff, and she said, did he ever say anything to you about anything like this? And he said, no. But he said, I know my brother, and if they told him not to say anything, he wouldn't say anything. Well, <clears throat> the ambulance driver is also dead. But his widow was still alive, so we went to see the widow. This was another trip I made out there. And we went to her house and had a tape recorder and video camera and so forth. She was uh, quite elderly, she had emphysema, she had a little, little trouble speaking. And she said that her husband, who apparently was driving the ambulance, uh, never said anything to her about it. But she said, I remember that the Air Force came by and took everything there was in the back of the ambulance, everything. She said, our sheets, we never got paid. She was the bookkeeper of the company. She said, we never got paid for the call and they never replaced the sheets or anything or the clips from the hospital. She said, they just took everything. And I was sitting there trying to think, granted this story, why would the Air Force come and take everything unless there had been aliens in the back of that ambulance. And when I interviewed the son of the, her son, the son of the ambulance driver, he said that he remembers, because he was a young guy at the time, he, was a, he worked as a uh, dispatcher in the, in the police department, he said he remembers talk in the police station about alien, dead aliens. Well, at any rate, it, it's an incredible story to me. And of course, part of it is, that, is, is the fact that this was so, um, so believable and so detailed. Uh, in a certain sense, it's a more interesting case than Roswell. Uh, not quite, but in a way it is. Uh, so this is where the case stopped. She thought she remembered the name of the nun who had been there too, and she spent weeks trying to find this woman through the whole hierarchy of the Catholic Church and had a terrible time and uh, apparently never, never found this person. But I found absolutely nothing to disbelieve about her account or about her. Um, it was a fascinating thing, but uh, the point is that uh, to put something like this in my book it would have made a, a nice chapter, but I thought I can hear the book slamming shut by all the people who are at least curious enough to go with it to some point. And uh, so that's why uh, it's left out. Now, <clears throat> there are also a number of things that I left out uh, in other areas. I didn't go into much, too much detail about the Linda case, but for those who of you who have read the book or know about it, but this is the case of, of Linda being abducted in New York City at three in the morning and floating out a 12-story window with three aliens below a UFO with all of its lights on and in front of a number of important political figures whose, whose uh, motorcade of cars had all been stopped by, of course, our friends in the sky. Other people had witnessed the whole thing from other points of view. And uh, actually, uh, two different of my witnesses said when they first saw this scene of Linda, this woman coming out this window in her nightgown and these three little figures going up into this brightly lit UFO, two different people said, they're making a movie. This is sci-fi. This is special effects. But what I didn't write about and uh, 
which is very interesting, and some of you may know this, but um, one of the agents uh, who uh, we call Richard, uh, who was one of the uh, witnesses to this whole thing and turned out to have had this long, complex abduction experience with, with Linda over the years. It's, it's a story so long to explain. Uh, but he was a Roman Catholic. And uh, he, had, he sent me a letter finally, a uh, Xerox letter, of a letter that he had written to Cardinal O'Connor who was, of course, at the time, the most important Catholic prelate in the United States, asking for an audience to talk about some unusual experience. Uh, and uh, he wasn't sending his letter, but he was sending the letter he got back. Uh, and uh, they were setting up an appointment that the cardinal was in Europe at the time. The cardinal was very, very close to the pope. Well, ultimately, through a whole series of, of events which Linda had to orchestrate, she got an audience with Cardinal O'Connor. She gave him a full account of her abduction and what happened, and uh, said in the letter, I'm a Roman Catholic. What is the church's position on this? I need, I need help. And he never directly answered her, but he ended up making appointments with her just to meet with her, the two of them, and giving her the idea that he could be, she could be very helpful to the church, uh, and he was thinking of varying possible ways she could, uh, she could go to Italy, and uh, uh, because of her sort of unique position as a, as just a, a lay person, a, um, <clears throat> a young Italian, well, youngish Italian American woman who had had this incredible experience. And uh, I have uh, copies of the notes that the Cardinal sent her and a photograph of Linda and the Cardinal together in his quarters. And we know, we know that he was very close to the Pope and we therefore can assume that the Pope knows all about this particular case and about the abduction phenomenon. And what turned up, um, which was ex extremely interesting to me, is that around this time, uh, the Pope issued a statement and, and through uh, his um, subsidiaries that there was no problem for Roman Catholics uh, if there should be the discovery of extraterrestrial life because, he said, uh, they will have the handprints of God, their fingerprints of God upon them. And the existence of extraterrestrials will do nothing to damage the faith, the Bible, and so forth. Uh, how do you like that as opposed to uh, uh, one of these preachers in the South who said that people who believe in UFOs should be stoned? It was actually something, I think it was Pat Robertson said that. <laughs> you would expect it of him. The Catholic Church, around this time also, bought uh, control and all the equipment in a major uh, observatory in, I believe, I'm not sure uh, whether it's Colorado or whatnot, and they invested millions of dollars, the Catholic Church, in an observatory in the United States. Arizona, thank you. And the point is that they had state-of-the-art <clears throat> art equipment, and they were also uh, going to enlist the help of NASA in certain mutual uh, projects, which involved, I assume, um, uh, the observatory in some way. All of this began to happen. Um, so. And there's a lot more to it that I'm not privileged to tell because uh, of Linda's requests. But uh, it's a staggering story. So it would seem to me that any time we wonder who knows about this, uh, whether it's an American president, it's just hard to believe that, uh, you know, Obama knows about it or somebody, 
I understand they tried to tell Bush, but he couldn't understand it. You know, he had problems. With <laughs> but the thing is, it's, it's safe to say that uh, the Catholic Church is fully informed. And obviously, because of cases like uh, the Beanie case and the retrieval of these bodies, uh, and there was a flatbed truck uh, as part of this procession at her hospital with a tarpaulin over some object in there, and we can guess what that was. The point is that we have to assume that there are many military people who are very aware of this. And of course, one of the things that uh, Stanton Friedman has brought up, which is, uh, I think, very interesting and very important, is that the government, the Air Force and so on, must have, um, you know, fast, immediate uh, response teams set up around the country for this reason, that flying around are, you know, bombers and things that used to be with atomic weapons aboard and certainly with all kinds of secret stuff. And if one of them should crash, um, just for some mechanical reason or whatnot, they're going to have to have a team that can get there really fast before somebody else gets there. Uh, like in the old days, the Russians or now the, the terrorists. So the idea of these rapid re, uh, response teams would, would have, makes perfect sense. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't make any sense to think no, no such thing exists. Um, now, I'm gonna go into just a few other subjects briefly, and then we're gonna, um, we're gonna do some Q&A. I hope I'm not uh, exceeding my time here, but at any rate, uh, another thing, and I, I've gotten into a number of, um, <clears throat> as some of you may have guessed, uh, controversies. Uh, one of the controversies which uh, uh, I'm still uh, involved in, even though I think that uh, it, the, the, this person is not, in a position of great strength right now, but this has to do with the late Colonel Corso. And uh, many of you may know that he wrote a book uh, called The Morning After Roswell, which was about the fact that uh, uh, he was uh, given the job of reverse engineering uh, wreckage from Roswell, which he had done uh, very thoroughly and so on, and had saved the planet, actually. He, he specifies that he saved the planet. Um, now, the problem with this book, which I, when I first heard about it, I thought, wow, this is, this is going to be big, until I read the book. And I realized that this man spent most of his life as a major or lieutenant colonel. He finally got, just before he retired, the kind of requisite bump up to being a full colonel, has no sign of anybody giving him any particular attention. And this is what you have to believe to believe Colonel Corso. And that is that every, this thing crashed at Roswell. The Army, Navy, the Air Force chopped it up the wreckage immediately. And each one took a piece of the wreckage home. And nobody did anything with them. For something like 17 years, nobody touched this stuff to do anything with it. Until one day, his commanding officer, who, had, who died by the time he wrote the book, came in with this box, cardboard box. He said there was stuff rattling around. And this guy, this, his boss said, uh, here, uh, Corso, you take this. This is space stuff that from a crash saucer. See what you can do with it. 17 years, nobody did a thing with it. Now, we know what happens, let, let's just say during the, uh, the Cold War. If a Russian MiG had crashed, we would have pounced on that thing. It would, every little tiny screw would have been kept together, taken to some kind of a uh, hangar. They would have brought metallurgists in. They would have brought scientists. This thing would have been dissected. Uh, he's, Corso said, well, when the colonel gave him this stuff, there wasn't any real paperwork on it. Nobody really done any real paper. But he, he figured it out, and he took 
this stuff around and everything was reverse engineered and uh, this and that came as, as a result of his having these things reverse engineered. Um, and some of the things, fiber optics, and some of the things that he, he claimed have an absolute impeccable history as to who actually came up with this stuff long before Corso was on the scene. And on top of that, Corso um, said that he was in touch with all these Russian spies in Washington. They used to hang out together. And he said that um, one of the spies uh, told him, said, you know, uh, when Roswell happened, he said, um, uh, Harry Truman, who was president then, uh, said in the, in the Oval Office to his cohorts, we got to keep this a secret because if Walter Winchell, the commentator on radio writer, if he hears about this, he said, he'll cook our goose, we're finished. So I wondered uh, how Corso heard all this stuff and how the Russians heard all about all this stuff. Obviously they had the Oval Office bugged or there was a mole in there, but he did nothing about it. He didn't report it to anybody. And I said to him, why did you believe these spies? Oh, well, they were trustworthy. The essence of Colonel Corso is that a little nobody, um, a little man who was very undistinguished in, in every way, somehow, with delusions of grandeur, wrote this grand fantasy. And uh, there is absolutely nothing to it. Now, the idea that there was reverse engineering, of course, there has to be reverse engineering because if we have anything like in the Beanie case, if you, they got pieces of things, they're going to be reverse engineering the heck out of them. But it didn't, they didn't wait around for 17 years to get to this. Uh, this was something that uh, was in Corso's imagination. And um, it's, uh, there's a, a great story called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Uh, which some of you, I'm sure, have read. Uh, <clears throat> and it's about a little man who has these imaginary fantasies of grandeur. And this is the classic Walter Mitty. Now, there are still people who say, this is an important person, this really happened. I feel sorry for Corso, or to some extent, um, although he certainly caused it a, a huge problem in the field because people who believed it, any scientist or any military person reading this book would say, what in the heck is this guy claiming? This, um, and uh, so I got in serious trouble attacking the colonel. I interviewed him once in Italy at a conference. I said, Colonel, give me one name of somebody who you took this material to to have uh, it uh, uh, back engineered or something, some person, I can, oh, no names, I can't give any names. I said, look, this is years ago, these people might be dead, or they might like some credit that they, they helped uh, save the whole planet along with you. And he said, oh, I can't give any names, no names. Like he was on this high point. Uh, I mean, it was a, a lamentable incident. Um, and it just leads me to one other little thing and then we'll do Q&A. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to talk about, but it's all in here so you can read it. But at any rate, in terms of uh, other subjects, uh, we have this issue which I mentioned called disclosure. And there are many, many people walking around saying, it's about to happen. Well, that they have been saying that for since probably since the late 40s. And it's about to happen. One of the leading people in this field said it was going to happen last May. Definitely by last May. I wish I was thinking of contacting him and saying, I'll, I'll bet you $500 to put it in escrow. Um, I, I would have 500 bucks to uh, be richer now. Another one of these people, uh, announced, uh, I guess he gave up on last May, but another one said, oh, it's going to happen in November. There are all these 
clues that's going to happen. They're just getting ready to say all these things. And um, one of them wrote that, uh, and said it at a press conference, um, just before the election, that if um, and the nominating procedures hadn't been finalized, that <clears throat> uh, Hillary Clinton, if she's elected, she's definitely going to announce right away. Um, now, I told this person, I said, did you read a remark that she made like two weeks before where somebody presented some political issue and she said, if you could believe in that, you're as crazy as somebody who believes in UFOs. But no, she's about to announce it. And uh, then the other one was uh, the governor of uh, Colorado, uh, or am I, oh, who am I thinking of? He, he was a, a candidate. Uh, I'm forgetting. He was he was a candidate, and they said if he gets the nomination, uh, he's definitely going to announce because. He worked for the CIA uh, for years. Uh, he was in charge of communication uh, with the aliens. So he's going to announce it. Uh, the people believe these things. The thing is, with what I was trying to say in that piece of, I read about uh, Rockefeller, is that uh, this is, has not happened for all these years. And there's obviously a lot of reasons why the government doesn't want to do it. And maybe a lot of reasons why these people don't even want to tell the presidents. Um, you know, I, does anybody think that uh, Senator McCain knows all about UFOs? I mean, it's ludicrous. Uh, this has been a very tightly held secret by some group. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's something that they do not want to make public at this point, uh, I think it would be, I think they owe it to the public, but I do think that there would be uh, conceivably a lot of social and economic chaos. And as I'm sure some of you have heard me say, because I've said it for years and years, that if the president or somebody were to say officially, uh, ladies and gentlemen, they're here, extraterrestrials, they, they're flying around, they can now fly anything we have. They're taking on men, women, and children in this program uh, that they're doing of abductions. Um, there's been no communications. We don't know whether they'll turn out to be friendly or not. We'll let you know when we hear more about it. Thank you and good night. <laughs> and I always said I would rather be in the liquor business than the stock market at that point. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, we are not going to have quote unquote disclosure. It's always said with a capital D. It's like this big word. Um, and of course, some of these people are very, very sincere. Who, who They read the tea leaves and they say, oh, you know, um, Secretary Gates made this remark where he used a certain word, so maybe that's a sign that he's trying to tell us something. Uh, well, at any rate, I don't think that's going to happen. Now, these are just some, some issues which uh, are sort of controversial because I have to say uh, our field, unfortunately, is not noted for its very, very high level of rational thinking. Unfortunately, uh, the nature of the subject means that, they're, that we're going to have people who dream about a certain outcome or have theories that they're going to present, uh, that they're, they're pet theories. Um, there are, I have dealt with, it's a good word, nutcases uh, in my life, including one guy who made uh, threats on the telephone. He said, left a message. Uh, my mind is completely gone, now I know I can kill. Um, sometimes I was getting two and three messages a day. He accused me of complicity in the murder of Martin Luther King, and, and on and on and on. 
we've all dealt with this kind of thing uh, at some point. It's unfortunate about the field, but it does attract people. But I'm saying, too, that uh, there are a lot of people in the field doing serious research who uh, sort of tend towards some very outre areas of thinking. And it's very good for each one of us, me included, to kind of test ourselves. Is this logical? Does this make sense? Is this something that might really happen? Etc. And um, on that very sort of gown and scolding note, and I'm not normally a scold, but uh, at this point, uh, I think we'll, if we can have some lights, uh, we'll see if anybody wants to throw anything or, or uh, <laughs> ask a question or whatever. But uh, thanks so much for coming. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.